I was a blonde haired, blue eyed child. Okay, this is gonna be fun. <laughs> the oldest of four in a small town in Ohio. Life was pretty good until the end of first grade when something strange happened. I hit a growth spurt. I quickly grew a number of inches, which made me one of the tallest kids in my class. My eyesight changed, which required me to wear glasses, and my hair became crazy curly and totally unmanageable. My good intentioned parents helped me pick out a pair of eyeglasses with bright blue frames that according to the eye doctor anyway, were what all the cool kids were wearing. My grandmother, whose hair was fine and permed weekly, assured me that every girl dreamed of having hair like mine. And clearly, I must be the envy of all my female classmates. Well, I knew grandma would never lie to me. So I held my head high and felt confident that my popularity was about to skyrocket. <laughs> well, <laughs> we all know how cruel children can be to each other. And it didn't take long for most of the kids at school to start making fun of the giant girl with blue glasses and totally crazy hair. Even some of my closest friends joined in. I was promptly nicknamed Mrs. Beasley. Remember her? <laughs> Here we go. Yeah, yeah. Uh, remember her? Yes. She was a regular on the American sitcom Family Affair. She was Buffy's doll that never said a word, but everyone who knew who she was, believe me, everyone knew who she was. I realize now that there were many other nicknames they could have called me that would have been so much worse, but I didn't care. From second grade through the end of my junior year in high school, very few of my classmates knew me by any other name than Mrs. Beasley. It was, it was horrible. With that nickname came years, years, filled with many incidents that my memory has chosen to blur the specific details of because they were so painful. However, even though I graduated more than 40 years ago, I can't believe that, the pain felt during those years is still as real and as fresh as if it happened yesterday. <laughs> it, yeah, okay. <laughs> One such incident was the time when two of the meanest girls in my class decided to call me at home. They just wanted to make sure I knew how worthless I was. Toward the end of the very upsetting phone call, my mother had enough and she grabbed the telephone receiver from me and started yelling at my attackers through the receiver. My mother still recalls that she told the girls that it was illegal for anyone to call someone at home to harass them. She had convinced them that they were going to jail. Thanks, Mom. <laughs> A big high five for my mom. Yes. Fortunately, the phone call stopped, but the harassment at school just got worse. I still have no idea if calls like that are illegal, but if they aren't, they should be. Then there was the time that one of the meanest boys in school, in my class, decided he was going to make my day particularly awful. And it just so happened that his mother was a substitute lunchroom lady that same day. As I walked into the lunchroom, I was absolutely devastated when he and his mother were standing together laughing and pointing at me. All I heard, all I heard was laughter and Mrs. Beasley chanted over and over again. As I looked around the room, it literally seemed as if everyone else had joined in the chant. 
Something broke inside me that day, and my trust of adults was never the same after that. Things got so bad that I spent most of my time trying to avoid eye contact and any other interactions with the majority of my classmates. I did everything I could to stay out of their way and out of the spotlight. I kept to myself and spoke only when spoken to. My self-esteem was about as low as it could be. I was lonely and I longed to be invisible, yet my heart ached to belong to their world and come out of the shadows. <sighs> well, everything changed one fateful day while I was sitting in my fourth grade class, music class actually, my teacher, Mrs. Womack, who was a short, round woman with bottle-rimmed glasses and energy that was always on high, asked me to sing a couple lines of a song. I literally froze for a moment, and then there was this little voice inside me that asked, what have you got to lose? Well, I didn't have much. <laughs> so I opened my mouth and closed my eyes, and what came out I had never heard before. It was my voice. There, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you. There was a feeling of freedom and power that I had never felt before, and I was smitten. Looking back, I often wonder if Mrs. Womack knew how much I needed a friend like that. Was that why she made the introduction? Had she been in my shoes at some point and sensed a kindred soul? She was odd in her own way, so I believe deep down she understood. Unfortunately, I never got a chance to ask her, even though we did stay in touch for many years after that. Over the next few years, my relationship with music grew. We became best friends when I had very few of them. I didn't care, it didn't care. If I towered over everyone, wore bright blue glasses, and had crazy curly hair. Music taught me a new way to connect with the others and that had nothing to do with the outward appearance. It had to do with connecting to emotions and the inner self. I found music spoke a language that, no, that knows no boundaries or age limits. Through music, I learned how to communicate with others on a much deeper level than I'd ever known before. The more positive responses I got from my listeners, the more I wanted to sing. I truly could not get enough. I was hooked. Call it a drug, if you will, but nothing had ever made me feel the way music did. I felt truly alive. When I sang, I knew that anything was possible, and it truly became my superpower. Thank you. <laughs> Musical theater called my name and opened its arms wide. I jumped in the beautiful songs of Rodgers and Hammerstein and numerous others. Many Oklahomas and Sounds of Music later, I could not imagine having more fun or feeling happier. I started singing for churches and special interest groups, primarily older adult groups. Turns out my favorite music was their favorite music and they paid me for it. <laughs> Never mind that I was a quarter of, of most of their ages. <laughs> that was years ago, okay? <laughs> they didn't care. My music spoke to them. They literally lined up after my programs to share the memories that my songs brought back to them. I collected a treasure chest of beautiful stories to share with my other audiences. I learned about the songs from the people who had lived 
through them, and it wasn't long before I started calling my shows musical walks down memory lane. They weren't all my memories. Mrs. Beasley was not gone. She was still part of my life, but with music by my side, I was, getting, I was getting chosen for choir solos and leading the musical female roles. Mrs. Beasley was now cool, and many of my classmates wanted to be my friend. But I didn't need them anymore. That sounds really nasty. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Music had introduced me to all of its friends, and I was busy getting to know them with no need for these others whatever they were. Anyway, finally, I belonged to something. I was making my own kind of music and loving every second of it. Let me tell you, time truly flies when you're having fun because the next few years were gone before I knew it. I graduated from high school and college met the most wonderful man in the world whose birthday is today and he's in the audience and I love him very much, whatever. We got married. It's his birthday. I have to acknowledge his birthday. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> we got married and had three children, fairly quick. We did it with a set of twins and a single son. And it was really wonderful. My husband understood my love affair with music from day one, and he has supported me without reservation ever since. So fast forward to today. I sing almost every day. I get paid well for it. I have woven music into every corner of my life. <laughs> I was even known for a short time as the singing insurance agent. I'll be happy to share that story some other time or after the show if you're interested. Music has taught me so many lessons. Above all, I've learned that we're all unique with our own special gifts and personal struggles. We all have so much going on that you can't see just by simply looking at us. It's when we take the time to get to know each other that we can truly understand and authentically communicate. And there are many ways to communicate. Music has been my mode of communication for years. Thank you, Mrs. Womack. Music has blessed me more times than I can, I can count. Winning the Toledo Easter Seals Talent Showcase, which included recording my first demo tape, being chosen as a finalist in the Ed McMahon's Next Big Star, basically the internet, thank you, the internet version of Star Search, and being part of a band that opened for the Moody Blues. And those are just some of the stories, thank you. Someday I am going to write a book all about my musical adventures. Again, thank you, Mrs. Womack. Life has not been perfect. It has had its ups and downs for sure, but through it all, music has remained my superpower. When the world seems to be against me, I know music is always there, and it has never let me down. So, I challenge you, what is your superpower, and how do you intend to make your own kind of music?